Okay. Hi, everybody. It's a little loud. So my name is Matt Akamatsu. Uh, I'm an assistant professor by day and meta science researcher by night. Uh, I have a research lab in the cell biology space at the University of Washington uh, that studies how non-living molecules self-organize into living cells. Uh, and as a meta science entrepreneur, we build and use collaborative software uh, in order to build our own knowledge organization infrastructure like uh, block science just mentioned, uh, which our lab uses as a distributed uh, knowledge base, uh, lab notebook, and internal nano publishing uh, software. Um, so I would like to be one of the Trojan horses that was mentioned at the beginning of this session uh, if, if you wanna work with me. Okay, so this is motivated by many of the same systemic challenges that people mentioned in the panel this morning, uh, namely that there is a high barrier to entry for scientific research. I think this is especially true for people who wanna work in a distributed research group, but it's also true if you're new to a new field, if you're new to uh, research on the whole. Uh, there's some social science research that suggests that one of the factors that allows a trainee to start calling themselves a scientist is when they make an original research contribution that other people in the field can use. And if you wait till you write a paper, that can be five or six years, and it's very demoralizing. Uh, and that's one of the factors that leads to, I think, really low mental health for trainees in academic research uh, and attrition from the research ecosystem that's quite uh, inequitable. A uh, second related note is that the academic research environment mostly accommodates one sort of phenotype, which is the PI that has a certain skill set, which is like all of the skill sets. Uh, and I equate, I equate this to non-sustainable agriculture. Uh, <laughs> uh, and it, it's such a, a shame that there isn't space for people who wanna contribute to the research ecosystem in unique ways that, that all fit together in a sustainable manner. And this analogy comes from uh, Greg Nelson, who's a, an HCI researcher. Uh, in Maine. Uh, and uh, finally, uh, organizational structure is something I'm increasingly thinking about, uh, just as we talked, as we heard from, from block science, as the key sort of meta level uh, to allow decentralized coordination among researchers. Uh, I really want to help contribute to building a decentralized network of researchers who are fueled by the intrinsic motivation to contribute to the global knowledge base. There's a lot of people who are doing science who are really motivated by that. And um, there's some research suggesting that uh, you can sort of keep this intrinsic motivation if the researcher has autonomy, a uh, sense of purpose, and a sense of expertise. And so thinking about the incentive mechanisms, or in our case, the organizational mechanisms, play a huge role in whether the researcher gets to keep their intrinsic motivation or not. In my case, as the PI of a lab, the hierarchy sort of consolidates power and knowledge in a way that sort of can suppress this intrinsic motivation unless the researcher is actually co-creating a project based on their own interests with me. If they're gonna do that, then they need coordination mechanisms, they need context. Okay, so how are we going to address this issue? Um, our hypothesis, like many of yours, is that new collaboration tools can facilitate cultural and organizational change. And our main approach is to break the research process into modular parts that can be shared, reused, uh, and cited. Uh, our initial use cases is that we aim to facilitate having researchers get up to speed on a new field of research, to identify holes in research that uh, motivate new experiments, for us all to create new theories of understanding together that synthesize interdisciplinary data, and for the regular exchange of discretized, let's say nano-published research results uh, between researchers who are sharing a common research question. Uh, so how do we do that? We, uh, decided to decompose the scientific argument, the scientific process into its atomic units and connect them into a graph. So the, the scientific arguments uh, in, the, in most, let's say all empirical science, I think can be broken down into questions, claims, and evidence. This comes from a science philosopher named Stephen Toulmin, who contended that science isn't about a bunch of universal truths. Instead, it's about a bunch of claims that are supported by more or less evidence. So the textbooks has like the best claims, but the textbook changes over time as new evidence arises. And this is part of a three and a half year collaboration that I've engaged in 
with Joelle Chan, who's an HCI researcher at the University of Maryland, who after three and a half years, I finally met in person yesterday, thanks to this meeting. So I've had such a good time here. Okay, so Joelle has uh, built a tool to take these atomic units of science and connect them into a graph. So he calls this a discourse graph. Here's our data model and here are the elements of the graph. Uh, each node is one part of the, the research process. So the research question is the motivation for your work. It's the unknown that you'd like to make known through your, your work. The claim is the proposed answer to the question. And the claim gets supported by one or more lines of evidence. So each piece of evidence is a single outcome or result from like one experiment or one simulation, um, or that's in a, in a paper, for example, that can support or oppose your claim. And the thought is that if we keep each of these separate, we can each work together on a different piece of evidence that supports the claim or extract this key result from this one paper and have that be its own little nano publication so you can reuse those pieces of evidence. And, if it's, and as everybody in the audience knows, if it's in a graph, then it's much more sort of findable and reusable. Okay, let's give an example. Let's say I uh, want to know this question, what is the fastest land animal? I claim that cheetahs are the fastest land animal. And there's a lot of apocryphal evidence out in on the internet, and if you ask ChatGPT, that don't really support uh, this claim one way or the other. But somebody did make a rigorous measurement uh, that supports uh, this claim. So in the mid-60s, a researcher tacked a piece of raw meat to the end of a Jeep and had a stopwatch and like a track of a defined length and measured you know, with n equals three what the speed of this cheetah was. And the methods has this great contextual information like at the time, the, the researcher was an athletics coach, and so was very good at stopwatches. Like all, all of this thing that's really key to understand the, the, the basis for, the, for this piece of evidence. And so we, we think of this piece of evidence as like a really hard observation that's true for this one point in time that you can always turn back to. Like it on itself um, isn't something that you especially sort of invalidate. Um, but it's one line of evidence to support our ongoing claim. And if you want to challenge that claim, you should probably come with your own piece of evidence and your own measurement. So it, it sort of sets up the motivation for other people to make alternative claims. Uh, and so we've been using this both to synthesize the state of knowledge for our favorite research questions and to advance knowledge uh, as we're uh, creating new evidence from our own experiments and simulations. Okay, how's this happening? We have this great sort of integrated network of developers and users. Um, we have two developers working on the project right now. So our, our prototype is an open source plugin within Rome Research, the graph-based uh, note-taking uh, app. And there are some sort of proof of principle earlier stage plugins of this type in other uh, open source pieces of software. Uh, we've been funded by Protocol Labs uh, Research uh, we've worked with the uh, self-funded HCI organization, uh, Invisible College, uh, and we're currently uh, funded by the crowdfunding platform, experiment.com uh, and Schmidt Futures. And the users are those of us over here in our cell biology research lab. We all share one discourse graph and use it to coordinate our day-to-day -day activities uh, and stay on the same page. And so there's this daily feedback between the user needs and the developer making changes. Uh, so from the literature synthesis point of view, how do we use this? Uh, we do a synthesis journal club. This means rather than our journal club being focused on a paper, it's focused on a question. So here's an open question that has to do with like how a cell attaches to like, its external environment. We find all of the research articles that might pertain to this question, divide them amongst everybody in the lab, and everybody just scans for the specific results that might pertain to our research question farm them out, and everybody collects evidence. I'll just sort of skip to the what this looks like at the end. We've actually built on top of the same canvas that we, heard, we just saw with block science. Let me make this a little bit larger. But our canvas includes these discourse node elements. So here's the sort of where we arrived at at the end of the journal club. You have this sort of working model that's founded in these claims, and the claims are supported by multiple lines of evidence. So each of these pieces of evidence 
is like a page. Let's open up the page. Um, and so it has the sort of the observation. It's connected to the research article, which in turn is connected to our list of our sort of shared collection of articles, which is in uh, Zotero. Uh, we include sort of the key snapshots that represent what the outcome is, uh, some contextual information that we that we thought was important, methods information, and then our own sort of subjective opinion about how much this piece of evidence actually supported the claim. Uh, so in the end, this this graph sort of represents our lab state of uh, understanding about the state of knowledge towards the specific research question. So that's a great way for us to start our project because we're more confident that we're at the edge of knowledge and our claim that we want to make that we can't because there's not enough evidence yet becomes the hypothesis that motivates the experiment so that we can figure out the answer ourselves in the lab. So that's when this project got really exciting, I would say, when I started to realize that uh, discourse graphs aren't just going to help our literature synthesis, but it's going to help our ongoing research. So here I've just sort of reformulated uh, the discourse graph schema, but on the right, I renamed the evidence to a result. So this is like an original result from our lab's work that's often founded in an experiment or a simulation. And as soon as I realized, well, what am I doing every day except for collecting new pieces of evidence that are trying to inform a new claim that I'm going to publish, all of a sudden it went, OK, this should be the substrate in the operating system for our distributed collaboration. And now it is within, within our lab. Uh, it's just fantastic. So you can imagine multiple people who are sharing one question. Um, they have different claims, but they're sort of based on the same evidence. There's all this sense making that, that comes out of it. Uh, different, you can argue whether evidence supports or opposes a claim. The workflow looks something like this. When you say, OK, I have my research question. Here's another plot of structure versus uh, effort, like what Ronan showed. Uh, and I have like uh, my claim um, after having uh, done the experiment, I made my observation. The claim doesn't quite answer the question as much as I thought it would. So that motivates me to go back and do another experiment. Or even better, I could bookmark that experiment because I know exactly what needs to be done. I might not have time to do it, but I'll just like save it for later. And I'll call that an issue. Um, and so if you're new to the lab, you can sort of start with a potential experiment. You can take existing data and like look for observations from it. This really lets you crowdsource the research process into these modular elements. Okay, what does that look like for our lab? I'll sort of give you a high level sort of newsfeed of the types of discourse nodes that our lab created recently. So here's sort of a live query within the, the lab graph of the questions and the claims and the evidence that different people in the lab have been creating while I've been at this meeting. So it's really nice to see that the lab is, is working hard. Um, and uh, each of these you know, has uh, linked contextual evidence so that other people can understand and explain them. And, and importantly, people are creating this because it's helping their own sense making. It's like part of their natural note taking they like, if they want to save it for later, they turn it into an evidence. If they don't, then it just gets stuck in their head and they forget things. And the half-life of their notes becomes very short. Uh, and it gets better and better the more you sort of add in these layers of formalization to just the key things that you want to remember for yourself or to communicate with the rest of the lab. OK, so here's some example. Here's like one result from someone's uh, simulations connected to like the actual uh, in silico experiment. Here's like the plot that's showing the result, and there's some like contextual information that helps you uh, explain it that we can look at in more detail uh, later if you if you'd like. Okay, well let's look at sort of the the high level overview of what our lab graph uh, looked like. Uh, let's say two three months ago. Um, here we're visualizing every page in the lab graph that's color coded by like questions or claims or evidence, plus a lot of other pages that are important for like meeting notes, et cetera, or, or papers uh, that are just sort of integrated into the, the, the overall network. And each line uh, represents an edge between two pages, but there's another layer of edges between individual like blocks in the pages that probably there's another factor of 10 or 50 more edges than, uh, than you're seeing here. I think it represents this wonderful, you know, interconnected, semantically labeled, time-stamped, sort of user-stamped uh, record of how we're doing sense-making. 
I think it'd be a great substrate for, for large language models to learn off of. And it's a way for us to have a continuous audit of what work we did when, like who it was influenced by. Uh, and it gives us this great sense of accomplishment because you can say each week, hey, I have a new result and other people are using it. I can see it being cited because somebody else tried to make the hypothesis that like uh, depended on my result. And so their sense of sort of satisfaction with their work and orientation to what to do next, I think has increased quite a bit. So our current inventory is we have something like a thousand of these discourse nodes created in the last 18 months for seven of us in the lab. Um, there's 400 research articles, so like several hundred thousand words, tens of thousands of edges, another like few thousand pages. It's just growing in this really wonderful organic way that I could never do, you know, for my own, like based on my own brain alone. But then, you know, how do you make sense of this sort of big uh, non-hierarchical graph of information? Uh, so there are a number of ways we do it. We, uh, we do synthesis. So we had a lab retreat in December where the main goal was to synthesize the discourse nodes that you had created over the past year and turn them into a coherent story so you could see what to do next. Okay, let's look at an example here. So here's this graduate student who sort of got like a query of all of her discourse nodes and they were sent to this open canvas and she did the, the organizing you know, the fun part of the sense making that Ronan was, was referring to. Uh, and she ended up with sort of like, okay, for this project, here's a hypothesis. She's looking at these specific questions. Uh, she has a couple of results that like lead to conclusions. The result uh, has sort of just the key like GIF of what the, the fluorescence microscopy data was, was showing. But if you're interested, you can sort of click into the underlying experiment. So this is now like an experiment node that has all the nitty gritty details for those who really want to like reproduce or interrogate what the context was for this result. Like what was the imaging modality? Like what was like the day-to-day -day log that, that she used? Like, so that information is available as the sort of lower level abstraction to the result. And it's uh, proven, oh, so here she, she figured out that the next set of questions she needs to address and then the desired next experiments, which are these issues that she or maybe somebody else in the lab uh, will carry out. And it's made writing uh, proposals for our future research really straightforward, as well as starting to write up our results into different kinds of manuscripts. The compilation step is happening as sort of the shared intellectual work. And all you have to do then is like write it down or have any number of ways to communicate the story that you know, you've already compiled uh, with our collective brain power. Okay, the last example I want to show uh, has to do with these issues that I mentioned. It would be really appealing for one person to be able to crowdsource their project now that they've done the intellectual work of figuring out what analyses or experiments should be done. Really, everybody who's interested in the same research question should be able to collaborate and make their own contributions. Now they know what, they're, what would be a genuinely useful contribution. So that's this uh, issues board that we're currently experimenting with in order to bookmark, hand off, and cite ideas between researchers. Um, let me just show the board itself. So this is just a query of the issues that you can sort of filter based on, you know, are you in a position where you can be doing a literature search or like, can you run your own simulation? Could you, do you have a lab? Can you run an experiment? Uh, and so we have some undergrads who just joined. They sort of get this query and they're starting to click into them and figure out which of these is interesting to me, which of these can I make sense of due to the contextual information. And then like who actually was interested in this in like meeting notes. So I know who to talk to, to get the mentorship that I need. Um, so this is our, our current experiment in self-organizing granular mini projects for new researchers to be able to learn what our lab is up to, to make a unique and substantive contribution that is modular, credit attributable and part of the larger picture of the research project. So now we have these, you know, hundreds of like results and pieces of evidence, like how are we gonna share them? Uh, of course we can compile them into traditional manuscripts, but we're finding increasingly that we wanna share them with would-be collaborators in a peer-to-peer -peer fashion. So you could imagine like our neighboring lab uh, is interested in the same research question as we are, and there could be a query that sort of knows 
that there are five results in our graph that pertain to this research question. Uh, and so you could sort of, you have some, some firewall here that says, if, you're, if you've decided you wanna collaborate, you can see all the results. And all of a sudden you've sort of grown the team. And we actually had a proof of principle of this briefly that was running on IPFS that I'd love to sort of reconstitute. Uh, second, we're uh, increasingly interested in micro publishing like a single claim from like a single figure that comes from a number of results. The results don't have to come from one person, uh, but you end up with like one take home message that's peer reviewed and, and, and cited. Uh, and then, you know, inspired by this meeting, what I think we want to move towards is just release the results one by one as they come out each week and then, uh, you know, upload them to as a nano publication or d nodes as a sort of natural last step of our like discovery. You say, hey, look, a new finding. Let's just upload it and then depend on some of the technologies that people have been talking about at this meeting to make those results discoverable and interpretable and part of a future sense-making process. I really don't know how to do this, this last step, which has prevented us from feeling like uploading the results was gonna be useful, but we're really happy to, to start doing it. Some of our results are sort of at a stage of maturity, which I think you know, would accelerate the overall scientific process by you know, a couple, by at least an order of magnitude, uh, rather than waiting five years to, to, for those results to see the light of day. Okay, so what impact has this had on people in the lab? So here's a quote. Um, Joelle is doing uh, HCI user experience interviews and writing this into a manuscript right now, which we'll share in, a, I don't know, a month or so. Uh, so this uh, graduate student says it's helping him streamline uh, his thinking. It's helping him separate out the numerous side directions that emerge from the core ideas we're trying to test. He can capture them, but then prioritize based on which issue, which experiments will actually uh, inform the hypothesis that he said he was interested in testing. And then finally, it provides a sense of direction and satisfaction with the work. It's easy to fall into a cycle of questioning the validity or importance of the work being done, but structuring the results as supporting or opposing hypotheses has helped me to reiterate to myself that the project is moving forward in a productive direction. So this is you know, the main outcome that has motivated me to, to make this the operating system for our lab. Okay, so for the sake of time, I'll just say that our lab Operating system has created this structured approach for researchers to be introduced to new projects into their lab. Uh, get, helps them keep a sense of orientation. If they have the result, it's time to look for the conclusion, et cetera. Great for self-organizing scientific processes. Uh, it's changed my role from being a manager to being more of a facilitator and synthesizer of other people's great ideas. And they're sort of fueled more by their own intrinsic motivation. And in the role of the scientific ecosystem, it's moving us towards, instead of this monoculture of like PI clones, we have this permaculture of researchers with diverse interests and skill sets and things that they wanna contribute. So here we have this list of like synthesizers, data generators, generalists, ideators, amateur researchers, evidence extractors that are all sort of working together to create a healthy ecosystem of discoveries, which in this case are like the, the fruits of, of our collective labor. And I'm contending that the layer underneath those discoveries that we don't usually get to see that we've now sort of exposed in hopefully an interoperable, sustainable, uh, attributable way are these uh, collective discourse graphs, which we increasingly want to connect to each other and make public uh, with your help. There are, I don't know, like say a dozen prominent labs, academic labs in the world who want to use this. We just need more support to make this accessible to them. Uh, if you'd like to look through this yourself, here's a QR card that links directly to this talk, which is, you know, written in Rome Research. You have some, if you want to see the whole graph, just email me and I'll give you read access to the whole thing. Uh, and there's also links to like our experiment.com project, et cetera. And I'd love to talk to you more about it. Thanks for your attention. Questions? Yeah. Let's... So right now it's uh, hosted by Rome Research. Uh, briefly, each of those blocks was hosted on IPFS as part of an experiment that Dave Vargas did for the same page. Um, 
so it could be hosted there, but right now it's it's sort of hosted in the cloud for like local access within our within our lab. Good question. I think it's like a Neo four J data database, but I I don't really know. Yeah, yeah. More of a comment, but I can say that it's absolutely. Thank you. I appreciate that. I would I would love to to work together because this seems like the right space of people who are sort of convinced that this is the way to go. Yep. So many thoughts. Um, first, it feels like you could use the discourse graphs to help you understand and, and even just your understanding of the amounts of confidence you have in various hypotheses of like this, right? Mm -hmm. um, is there any work being done on that? Yeah, so right now we have a very local representation of our confidence. The way it's worked pragmatically so far is that because people have access to the layer of evidence and they can see at a glance like what the method was and like sample size, et cetera, they, that calibrates their own internal confidence when they're making the hypothesis. And that, that confidence is usually not uh, like articulated in the graph. Um, and our goal right now is to make, is to represent our like subjective decision about what our confidence is at a like individual level and, and at, at the graph level. There's a lot of, I think, promise in weighting the edge, like having different people weight the edges differently that we could do. Um, we, you know, we have this sort of like proof of principle slider about like how, how, what your confidence is. I use this in my classes so that students get a sense of like what their own subjective opinion is, uh, but we're not really operationalizing that yet. We, we'd like to. So it does, it feels like that's going to be Yeah, I totally agree. I think this sort of collaborative canvas that that uh, Block Science has made is, is a great way for people who just want to get the facts down to be able to record them. And then there's lots of ways you can make sense of them, for example. But I totally agree. Just the base layer of, like, even though we have wildly different, like, schemas and dogmas and, and claims, particularly in news, there's often, often there's a, there's like these discrete observation of facts that people should be able to agree upon that went, like might give us more so agreement. For all that, actually, both of these, we have a crisis in uh, initiation practice, right? So uh, within these types of graphs, if you are thinking about credibility as a, a weighting factor, then it makes it a lot easier to uh, screen it when down the line, somebody's research or somebody's lab um, is exposed from a credibility perspective to help to rapidly understand across the, the discourse graph, across the knowledge graph, what results are now suspect and probably need to be rerun by other labs with more credibility. Same situation in the journalism sphere where, you know, when someone is exposed to be not credible, like all of their content and what they claim to contribute to are now suspect. End of comment. Yeah, that you could imagine an attestation for, you know, has this been reduced uh, reproduced? There we do we did create an edge between results in our in our graph that says, is this reproducing somebody else's result? And you could sort of select for those. It's sort of the opposite, let's say, like incentive structure um, to like, is it novel and is it is it is it different? It's more like, is it solid? Is it can you build off of it as it reproduced? Yeah. Yeah, uh, I love this work. I was doing it for that reason. Um, I want to see like hundreds of labs using these kind of tools. I think that's that's where the future is headed. You can make it through that way. Also, building on your comment about like moving this stuff out of just labs. I mean. Because, you know, kind of a soapbox in mind that like 
instead of arguing on social media, can we be constructing Discord graphs together on social media? Mm -hmm. It's changing, like, what the nuclear bullet has this quote, you know, if you want to change, go out and teaching people new ways of thinking, just give them tools, and tools really subtly and affect how you think. Yeah. Yeah, that'd be fun. It's sort of like an argument on Twitter. You say like, let's take this outside to the discourse graph, and like, show me the show me the evidence, and like, let's spend a couple hours actually seeing if we can get somewhere on on this. That'd be really fun. Yeah. Yeah. They. I think now they're like they're breathing the air so much that they can't imagine how to do science without it. Um. They're like some undergraduates who say like, how do other labs like organize their knowledge and their projects and their papers? And we're like, that's a really good question. Um, there's still like Rome specific multiplayer and user like experience challenges that are like completely Rome specific that uh, mean that my role is to help like orient them and make sure that they're like working in the graph uh, in a productive way, um, which is why, especially as we scale larger, uh, but on the whole, they they've sort of drank the Kool-Aid and now want to micro publish their results and they uh, are teaching other people about it. It's it, it it does have this sort of like viral interest. We just have to lower the access barrier to to like setting these things up. And most labs say like my alternative is nothing at all. So we, <laughs> we'd really like to use this thing. Um, so it's the the sort of user experience confusion of taking a very flexible graph-based note-taking software and putting a plugin on top of it. Um, so it's not totally obvious when you're like writing in your own, let's say like lab notebook notes, when it's time to like go into one experiment or another. That's like um, when I was looking at the schedule for DSI last year, I learned about a shelling point. So we're like, far, like not close enough to this situation where the next obvious thing to do is um, whatever it is, like create a new experiment. So we do that now as a group. I think like a, like a, a solid like user experience design arc would would solve a lot of those issues. Yeah. Is the that you can execute with this to promote adoption? Yeah, I think the, the proof of concept is gonna be that we're gonna start uh, sharing our discoveries in a sort of dual use way. We're gonna like release the results as they come out. Maybe they'll just go into the ether, like we won't worry about that too much. And in parallel, we're gonna compile them into these papers that people sort of understand and um, that we give the students practice in like writing narratives. And people say, wow, like you made these amazing like discoveries, like, and you work together, that's so rare. Like, how did you do that? And we say, well, it's because we have this discourse gap, are you interested? Um, so I think that's gonna take you know, like a couple of years as the projects mature, the students like continue their 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 PhD projects. Um, but at now at academic conferences, I often will talk about half about cellular biophysics and half about discourse graphs. And people love hearing about it and they really think like this is the future. It's just like they they say I'm in support of it or like I'm ready to use it. We just gotta make it more straightforward for them to use it. Oh, yeah. Hey, I'm talking from the industry side when it comes to research coming out of academic institutions. And we focus real world evidence, clinical evidence gathered in market. There's a big push from the NIH as well as BARDA funding the ideation process, new molecules that are coming out. Because when they go to clinical trials, the number one reason clinical trials fail is if it's a small batch and put in the market, it's effective. That's the number one place. So there is stuff in the commercial world and the grant world that will fund adoption and growth of exactly what you all are talking about. So, yeah, please do. Uh, but we also want to publish like hypotheses that are rigorously, you know, grounded in evidence, and then people will cite later. But there just needs to be an avenue for that. So, great. Yeah, we could use everyone's help, and we want to work together, of course. Thank you.